All right, uh, let's go and get started. Um, this is we're going to continue our discussion of maximum moment capacity and probably get a little bit into actually ACI requirements for beams. Um, I might not have printed those slides out, but no big deal. I'll give them to you next time. They're not incredibly uh, complex uh, requirements. <laughs> and then after this, uh, and we discuss the ACI requirements. I'll probably give you all an assignment on Monday so that it will be due next Monday. So that way, um, for those of you in, in steel and <laughs> for those of you in steel and concrete, you're not having the same thing due on the same day. And I'm going to do my best to try and stagger those. My goal was to like have them separated between I think two lectures, so that way like maybe Monday and Friday or Friday and Wednesday or something like that. So that way you know you're not getting hit all at once. <laughs> all right. Um, let me get the sign-in sheet started. All right, so real quick, let me go back a couple slides to make sure we're all um, clear with, I guess, the problem. You know, we discussed this notion or this concept of instead of using sigma equals my over i to determine how much moment is in a section, we say, well, we'll just make an assumption of what the stress profile looks like and then integrate it directly, which is easy if you've got something like a rectangular stress distribution or a triangular stress distribution. That stuff's easy. The problem is this. You have, if you have a nonlinear stress distribution, as you would if you're dealing with concrete design and specifically looking at its maximum moment or its moment right up until impending failure, you have a highly nonlinear stress distribution. You have to be able to account for that. Just because it's complicated doesn't mean the problem goes away. So we, I, I presented a, a tiny you know, smidgen of calculus to try and explain the, I guess, a understanding or a, uh, a concept behind how this works. And, and what I was basically getting at is I have this nonlinear function and I calculate the area and moment generated by that function between 0 and 1 area and moment to try and represent, you know, sum of forces equals zero and sum of moments equals zero. That's why I care about these two values. <laughs> and I propose to you that I can come up with that, with a similar model that does the same thing, okay? And lo and behold, I can, and I'll go forward a little bit. I propose to you that this function and this function here generate the same area under the curves and the same bending moment. Um, the model that we use in HCI for concrete beams is very similar. Okay? We always assume a constant stress of 0.85 FC prime. That's the width of the stress block. This is always 0.85 FC prime. The depth, however, changes. The depth is this term A is a function of the concrete strength beta 1. This is, that's a term that's related to FC prime. And then C, the depth to the neutral axis. And we started to explore that concept by looking at this particular example. I have a beam that is 10 inches wide. It has a, uh, an effective depth of 23 inches um, uh, and an area of steel. I think it was like 2.37 or something like that if you consider three number eight bars. Now, one thing I will point out. I've, I'm introducing some notation to you, and I'm not doing it casually. I'm being very cons trying to be very consistent with what I term. For instance, this distance from the top of the beam to the steel, the tensile steel, I'm calling D. We will always call it D for the rest of the semester. When we put compression steel in beams, and we put steel up here, like here and here, the distance from the top to that steel, we call that D prime. Okay. We'll see that later on when we start getting into this notation. I might uh, print off a sheet from the, it actually comes out of the FE reference manual. It actually is a pretty nice summary of all the, the notation we'll use uh, for this stuff. <laughs> but it's just something I wanted you to be made aware of. Um, let me go to the notebook here. All right, now I'm hammering this, this concept here into the ground because I really want you all to be familiar with what I have here on the screen. This is 
really important stuff, and, and, I, and I don't say that lightly. We'll use these types of models throughout the semester. So I really want you to be comfortable with this. So I have a beam. It is B wide, and it's D tall, okay? Now, the distance from the top of the beam to the neutral axis, we term that C. And we know that at the ultimate state, we're going to have this nonlinear stress distribution. So we say to simplify that, we idealize it as such. So to start off, the tensile force at the bottom. I'm going to assume for now, and we'll talk about that assumption here in a little bit. I'm going to assume for now that that steel yields. Okay? So the force in that steel, I'm calling that capital T, is the area of steel times Fy. Okay? Make sense? All right. Now, that's the force in the steel, the tensile force in the section. What about the force in the concrete, the compressive force? Why well, I'm saying it is this stress times the area it's acting on. The stress is 0.85 Fc prime. The area is A times B because it's this depth acting over this beam width. If you want, you can kind of think of it like this. We have you know, this sort of hatched section that is experiencing a constant stress of 0.85 Fc prime, and it's B wide, and it's A tall. It's not to C, it's to A. Okay? Everybody all right with that? Now, any questions? Okay, now, I want you to look at these terms. Do we know AS? Do we know FY? We know 0.85. Do we know FC prime? It's 4,000. It was specified in the problem. Do we know B? What is B? 10 inches. Do we know A? Like pressure, like big money, big money, no whammy, no whammy, no whammy, stop. Nobody gets the reference. Okay. All right. W what don't we know? We don't know A. Make sense? Okay. Now, how do we find out what A is? Well, I look at this cross section and I think, well, if I have a beam and I'm sitting on this beam, hopefully the beam isn't running away from me. The beam is predominantly sitting still. And why do things sit still? They're under static equilibrium. So what can you tell me, thinking of it that way, what can you tell me about these two forces? They're equal to each other. That This force better equal that force. Otherwise, the beam is running away from you. So I propose to you that to determine what A is, we must recognize that C has to equal T. Make sense? Or in other words, 0 0.85 FC prime AB must equal ASFY. Make sense? So what's A? I take both sides and I divide, right? So therefore, A is ASFY, a little better than that. Over 0 0.85 FC prime B. Sounds good? Okay. What is AS? You tell me. Tell me what to write. What's AS? There we go, 2.37 inches squared. What's Fy? Right, we'll keep that in PSI. It doesn't really matter if you do PSI or KSI as long as you're consistent. Okay, what's Fc prime? 4,000, there we go. And B is 10 inches, right? So 
if you if you put in PSI or KSI, it doesn't matter. All right, plug and chug, and that's going to give you a value of about 4.182 inches. So I propose to you that that stress block must be 4.182 inches to achieve equilibrium from a force standpoint. Does that make sense? Everybody good? Okay. Now, I'm lazy, so I'm copying a lot of this. That's good enough. Oh. All right, there we go. I just wanted my diagram up here again because I refer to this so much. Okay, so you're telling me A is about 4.2 inches, okay? Now, let, let's, you know, we're going to bring it back to some, you know, fundamentals, you know, mechanics and statics, whole nine yards. Okay, so. A was the distance required such that this force equals this force, right? All right. Now, let's bring it back to some statics. If I have some force, we'll call it F, and some force F acting as such, how do I determine the moment generated by these two forces, if they're equal? Well, I've got some moment arm between them, call it Z. How do I generate the moment generated there? How do I do that? Force times moment arm, right? Make sense? So for this problem, let's talk about the force. Do I use C or do I use T? It doesn't matter because they're equal. Now, for the sake of simplicity, do I, as a, a, a lazy person, want to multiply four numbers together or two numbers together? I'm just going to multiply two numbers together. All right? So I'm going to say that my moment is the force, which is, I'm going to say ASFY, times some moment arm. Okay? Now, you look at this image and tell me, what is the moment arm between these two forces? Not, okay, that's a good question. All right, that's a good observation, D minus C. Let me, let me do this. Let me put the D on there. Would you agree that this distance here, that distance is D? That's D, right? So. There you go, D minus A over 2. Does everybody see that? Because D is from here to here. Take half off that, and now I've got the distance between the center of this force and the center of that force. Does that make sense? Because all right, if I start here, D would take me all the way up there. Now, A is the total depth of this block, but this is like a distributed load. The resultant of that force is halfway in the center. You see what I mean? That's a good question. All right, is everybody okay with that? So, okay. Now, here's the thing, okay? We're, let, let's keep in mind the stresses that we're talking about. We're talking about this profile being generated by the maximum stress in the steel. We're talking about 60,000 PSI. We're talking about this nonlinear representation. We're talking about the final be-all, end-all moment capacity. I propose to you this is the maximum nominal moment capacity of a beam right here, a singly reinforced beam, I should say. This equation is very important. I feel like I should box it even one more time to emphasize its importance. We will use this equation 
quite a bit. Okay, so get comfortable with it. I promise. Let's actually use it today. Okay. All right. So. So, MN is ASFY. What's AS? It's 2.37 inches squared. What's FY? It's 60,000 PSI. We can keep it in PSI. That's no problem. What's D? Yep. Okay. Minus A. What, we, what was that? 4. over 2. Now you plug and chug your numbers. Somebody tell me what do the numbers generate for this? It'll be big. Like I'll be on, I, like I'm getting this. Now your decimals might be different. Something about like that. Yeah, yes. The answer is yes, because it's still the same distance between those two forces. D minus A over 2, that's the Z. That's the moment arm between your two forces. Is that what y'all are getting? Something about like that? What are the units? Excuse me. What? No, it's inch pounds. This is a moment. So that's a pretty large number. I like my moments in foot tips. So we'll take this, divide it by 1,000. 2973.2 will give me inch kips. And then how do I convert that into foot kips? Divide by 12, and that'll give me I propose to you that if I have this beam and I start loading it, that's the point when it starts to fail. Because, okay, this is in inch kips, that's in foot kips, I divide that by 12. Now that, that, that's a fair question. Yeah. Any questions? Now, are you all comfortable with this model, how we're using uh, this model to compute capacity? We assume the steel has yielded. We assume 0.85 FC prime stress in the concrete. We basically calculate what is the depth of that stress block such that C equals T, and we sum moments. That's all there is to it. Everybody all right with that? Yes. Yes, 247.8 foot kips. Now, what we haven't talked about is what is the fee value? What is the resistance value for re resistance factor for this? I can go ahead and tell you it's probably going to be 0.9. A lot of cases for concrete beams, it's going to be 0.9. And we'll see why here in a second. All right, is everybody good so far? Okay, now I'm fairly sure you all don't have these uh, handouts with you right now. No big deal. I will get them to you on Monday. So I guess this will kind of be movie time for now, and you all can just watch. Yes, sir? Phi MN. That's a good question. The nominal moment is, is MN, what, what it would take to fail. But then we must adjust that by an appropriate safety factor. We're going to get to that here in a second. Let me say this. For what we do in steel design, safety factors like fee values are, are pretty simple. You just look them up. And, and we've actually, we did that today. We were looking at a tension member and gross section yielding up, fee's 0.9. You just look it up. For this, it's a little different. You kind of actually have to compute it. 
or at least determine what it's going to be based on your conditions. And we'll talk about here, that here in a little bit. So what I want to do is discuss what are some ACI requirements for reinforced concrete beams. And this is in general, okay? So let's go up, up, uh, back to some of our fundamental discussions, okay? So when you open up ACI, and you all actually have a copy of ACI, so if you want, you can look this up. It's in Chapter 10 of that spec. But um, you go to ACI 318, and you start reading it. It says, ACI states, bleh, ACI states that the following assumptions are to be made in determining the nominal capacity of a beam. And a lot of this we've already been through. Now, one of the things we didn't state was we didn't talk anything about the strains. We talked about stress, but we didn't talk about strain. Remember, there's this whole concept of stress and this concept of strain, and they're kind of related. Okay? When we calculate uh, strains, we assume that strains vary linearly from the neutral axis. In other words, that plane sections remain plane. So because of that, while we might get this weird, funky, nonlinear stress distribution in the concrete from stress, from a stress perspective, for strains, we just assume linear. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Okay? We do that so that we can make some checks of stuff later, and, and you'll see why. Now, let's talk a little bit about that strain profile. It's linear, okay? Now, how do we generate this strain profile? Well, we start off here at the top. We look at the, the, most, the largest compressive strain that we get in the concrete, okay? Now, one thing that's kind of nice about ACI provisions is that regardless of whatever type of concrete we are dealing with, ACI assumes that the maximum usable strain you can get in the top of your concrete is .003. Regardless of if you've got 4,000 PSI uh, mix, 5,000 PSI mix, it doesn't matter. You always assume that your maximum usable strain is .003. Everybody okay with that? Now, if you do that and you assume that here's my strain profile and this is .003, this is just like similar triangles. It's just like ratios. It's actually really easy to compute the strains everywhere else. You just need a starting value, okay? <coughs> well, that's from a strain perspective. As for the stress perspective, again, I want to hammer this in, okay? My tensile force, ASFY, my compressive force. It is uh, the area under compression, A times B, multiplied by a uniform stress of 0.85 FC prime. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is how we relate the depth to the neutral axis, so where the strain equals zero, to the depth of this stress block. Yes, sir? Yes. We're getting to that. Okay. We're, give me two and a half seconds, okay? Now, beta one is a function of your concrete strength, okay? As concrete strength gets higher, the depth of that stress block gets lower. Okay? Now, if you're dealing with concrete compressive strength that's 4,000 PSI or less, beta 1 is taken as 0.85. Anything off of that, it's a linear trend down. And so it's like if it was 5,000, it's 0.8. If it's 6,000, it's 0.75. 7,000, 0.7, so on and so forth. So for that particular problem, because FC prime was 4,000 PSI, beta 1 was 0.85. Okay? I didn't want to throw too many details at the very beginning, so I figure I'll just give you what beta 1 is, and then I'll come back and explain why it's 0.85. And it's 0.85 because of FC prime. Does that make sense? Yeah, but what would you have to do to calculate Not directly, okay? Let me show you something. We're going back to it. I promise. We got other stuff to do with this example. Well, it's there, so. But we're not. Gonna, we're probably not going to get to that till Monday. I'm thinking of actually uh, letting you out a, a little early today, and that is if you want to stay until till the you know a lot of time of 10:50. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A couple other points that we need to make. So. One of the nice things about concrete design is because of its versatility, I mean, concrete is a, a free-flowing material. You can form it into any shape you want. I mean, you can have rectangular beams, T-beams. You can form concrete canoes. You can do whatever you want with it. 
okay? But because of that, there are some provisions, some limiting values that you need to assign to beams so that they behave normally, okay? It's kind of tough to do that when you can make beams look however you want. So there are a couple provisions. There's not many of them, but there's a couple of them that you need to check, okay? One of them, <coughs> excuse me, one of them is a, a limit on a minimum steel requirement. In other words, I don't care what the beam looks like, you have some minimum amount of steel that you must provide. Even if you've got adequate strength, the code says, no, 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 well, you've got to provide at least this much steel. So you have this check that it basically is meant to guard against the beam suddenly failing, okay? You need a certain amount of steel so you get a little bit of ductility in it. I mean, when, when steel fails as a function of yielding, it's pretty gradual and pretty slow. When concrete fails as a function of crushing, it goes and it goes quick, okay? So the code wants at least some minimum uh, procure, or provision of steel in there. <clears throat> now, if you go to the code, the code says, okay, you calculate that minimum area of steel requirement as the width of the beam, which I've got this B sub W. I'm introducing this notation to you now because uh, this is going to be a little different when we look at T beams. For now, this is just B, the width of the beam. It'll make sense later. So the width times D, that effective depth from the top to the steel, divided by Fy, times the maximum of whatever you get here, either 200 PSI or this. I made a point to put this PSI there because we've got this. Remember how this works. You plug in PSI, you get out PSI. Okay? Everybody good? <coughs> okay. Now let's talk about those strains. Now what you were asking earlier is, can we use beta 1 to calculate the, the A value? And the answer is, well, yeah, you can incorporate that, but that's not really what we need it for. What we need it for is to assess the strains, okay? There's a couple reasons why. Number one, when we did our problem, we said, okay, the force in the steel, I just said, well, we'll just say AS times FY, right? Just AS times FY. So I just assumed the steel yielded. Don't I need to check that assumption? Don't I need to uh, make sure that my assumption is valid? Y yes, I do, okay? Now, how do I determine whether or not a material has yielded? It's if its strain has exceeded the yield strain, okay? So how do I calculate that strain? Well, watch this. I assume this is 0 .003, right? Would you agree that the ratio of this distance to that distance is equal to the ratio of that distance to that distance? It's just similar triangles. It's just ratios. So I use that relationship, the fact that everything is linear when it comes to the strain, I use that relationship to, to ask, well, how much strain is right here, okay? I use that to make that assessment. So now I can calculate what is the strain in the steel. And if that strain is larger than the yield strain, then I know I'm good. Now, how do I calculate the yield strain? Keep in mind, we're talking about a stress-strain curve that looks something about like this. Remember? That's the stress, that's the strain, and our curve looks you know, something like that. And then, so we're talking about the yield strain, that is the yield stress, that slope is E, right? We assume that's linear. So how do we compute that yield strain? It's just a ratio, right? So if we're dealing with grade 60 steel, we would get a yield strain of about 0 .002. So if your strain is larger than that, then you know that you've achieved yielding and your assumption was valid. Everybody okay with that? Very good. All right. Excuse me. Now, one of the things, though, that, that is kind of, um, I guess I should say, it's kind of silly that you have to, to verify that assumption. You probably still need to go through and check it. But one of the things that ACI states is that regardless of um, whether or not you're, you know, you're assuming yielding or what have you, they're basically stating that you almost have to ensure that your tensile steel yields when you design a reinforced concrete beam because they dictate that whatever steel that you use, you better have a strain in that tensile steel greater than or equal to this. So if grade 60 steel yields here, 
but they ensure that this is your limit. This is ACI's way of basically saying, I don't care what you're dealing with. If you have a beam and you have tensile steel in that beam, it better yield. Okay? And the reason why ACI is so concerned about that is because yielding, or, or yielding, I say uh, reinforcement yielding in a concrete beam is something that we would want to happen. In other words, if I have a beam and I'm loading it and it's starting to get close to failure, I want that tensile seal to yield because yielding corresponds to gradual failure. It takes a long time. Yielding is not a sudden phenomenon. If the member is governed by its compressive behavior, when it fails, it's going to go. Okay? And that's not something that we, we like. We would like to avoid that. See, one of the reasons, or one of the ways that we incorporate that in the code is with our fee values. Remember, we calculate a nominal capacity, but we then adjust that by a fee value for factors of safety, right? Remember that? For beams, generally the fee value is around 0.9. For columns, it's 0.65. So what we're saying is a column, that sucker is completely in compression. When it fails, it fails quick. So we say, no, 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 we're going to have to reduce that load quite a bit to ensure a uniform level of safety. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk a little bit about strains in beams and, and, uh, and, and how we, or I guess I should say strains and elements in general, and how we classify behavior according to ACI. We kind of have three classifications for behavior. When we have an element where the tensile steel has a lot of strain, we call that a, a beam that is tension controlled. In other words, it's governed by its behavior of elements in tension as opposed to its elements in tension. And that's something we generally like in a concrete beam because the steel yields before the concrete crushes. So what that means is that when you have that situation, you tend to have very, very large deflections, but it's also very sudden. So you have a, a a good you know, gut check that if you've got a really heavily deflecting member, you know something's wrong, but you can get people out and everything will be safe. On the other hand, if you have a member where you have really, really low tensile strains or no tensile strains at all, we call that a compression controlled member. And that is not something we like because the concrete crushes before the steel yields, uh, and that's bad because it cracks and it's gone. So, we handle that with our adjustment factors, as you'll see here in a little bit. Now, anything in between, we call a transition region. It's kind of somewhere in between uh, uh, compression controlled and tension controlled. Now, how do we account for this behavior? It's through these fee values. Remember, when we calculate a nominal moment capacity, it is just that, a nominal moment. What, if I go down to the lab and load it, where do I start to see incipient failure? You know, physically what's going on. But we need to, we then need to reduce that nominal moment for safety reasons. We've got uncertainties in our material strength. This model that we're using in ACI, this rectangular stress block, it is an assumption. It is also a guess. It is a really, really good guess, but it's a guess. Concrete, as you well know, is a very highly variable material. Okay? It's not uniform like steel or something like that. And even steel in and of itself is, uh, is, uh, uh, can be ununiform at times. Are you sure that, can you tell me with absolute certainty that, that this piece of rebar over here and this piece of rebar here, over here are exactly the same, exactly the same dimensions? Yeah, you, there, there's always uncertainties in this stuff. <laughs> now, how do we assess that with a fee value? We use this model. So, let's take a moment and pay attention to this. First off, Tensile controlled members, members that have really, really, are able to develop really, really large tensile strains. They're fine. We have a lot of warning before failure. The, the yielding process occurs gradually. We're good to go. We say, you know what, we're fine to have a pretty high fee value, and we use a fee value of 0.9. Okay? On the other hand, if we have a column, okay, column where we have a member that is totally in compression, now when that sucker goes, it's going quick. So our fee value is reduced quite a bit. Fee is 0.65. Anything in between, we use this linear fit. Now, keep in mind, I will want you to want to point this out. ACI requires that beams have strains limited to this. 
So because of this, when you're doing a beam problem, it's very possible that you have a phi value in this linear trend. Okay? And I'll just go ahead and flat tell you. I put a problem on the last exam when I taught concrete design where phi value was in here. And just about every single problem or person in the class got it wrong. So just food for thought for later. Make sure that you're not just using phi equals 0.9. As we go on and start getting deeper into this stuff, it's going to be real tempting to just say this is always 0.9. No, 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 no. That's not the case. Okay? <coughs> Everybody good? So the equation for this linear fit is just a function of the actual strain in the steel and e, uh, your epsilon sub y, your strain at yield, which is just that. So it's very plug and chug, but it's something you need to check. All right? Everybody good? Okay. Now, this is just a, a note on, on uh, notation. I'll be honest, I'm probably not going to get to... Uh, embroiled into this. Um, I just want you to be made aware that there's a difference between the strain at the very, very bottom and the strain at the center of the steel. We use this E sub S and this E sub T a little interchangeably in this class because I really don't, uh, we really don't do very many problems where you have multiple layers of steel. I'm not saying you don't see them in the real world, but right now I just want you to get familiar with the concepts and the understanding. You can pick this stuff up later. It's not that big of a deal. All right, uh, is everybody good with these provisions so far? Okay, this is what I'm going to do because I'm feeling quite generous. We're going to call it today. Y'all going to come in on Monday. We're going to go back to example four and go through some of these ACI provisions. And then we're going to ask ourselves a very fundamental question. Now, I'm just going to give you food for thought for later before you leave. Give me one sec. You're gonna like. I think you'll like what I've done here, because uh, um, you know, ultimately, what we're going to do is we're th just to give you a preview of things to come. We're gonna go through these ACI provisions for a concrete beam, and then we're gonna ask ourselves the following questions: How do we get economy in a reinforced concrete beam? Like, what defines an economical design and an efficient design? And we'll talk about that, you know, as we get onto this, but. The reason why this is so important is because we use these economical discussions and this concept of a reinforcement ratio to do this. And literally, look, procedure for design, step by step, step by step. I think you'll, you'll find it's very cool. You know, it's one of the things I really enjoy about a class like this is because we're not, we're not calculating dot and cross products in here. And you're, this, this is real life stuff that we're doing in here. The answer is put four number seven bars at 20 inches below the top of the beam. That's the design. So I, I find it to be pretty fun stuff. Right. Everybody good? That's all I got. I will see you all next week. You all have a great weekend.